Hello ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to Evolving Consciousness. I am your host Pushota and in today's video we are going to explore the real treasure. Yes, you heard that right. We are going to understand what real treasure really means and where can any individual get his real treasure. Now let's deep dive into this concept and this is going to be the last video on the series which we started on this phenomenal book as a man thinker by James Allen and the theme of today's video is the real treasure. Now to give you some context, this particular chapter, the last chapter of as a man thinker talks about a word which is called serenity. To give you a very layman definition of serenity, serenity is something which can be equated to calmness. It can be equated to a tranquil state of mind, at peace in general. Now you might be wondering why is serenity considered the real treasure? Now let us go inside the book and see what James is talking about and I will assure you that the kind of context and the narrative he has wrote about the concept of serenity is literally going to blow your mind. Now let's go into what James is talking about in this final chapter, Serenity. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. It is the result of long and patient effort in self-control. Its presence is an indication of ripened experience and of a more than ordinary knowledge of laws and operations of thought. Now, if you think about it, right, even if you have a general viewpoint of life, if you sort of ask yourself as to why are you doing what you're doing, it can be from the most trivial things to the most sophisticated goals you endeavor to accomplish, you will sort of find yourself answering that I'm doing all this because I want to feel a sense of happiness. Because let's understand, every human endeavor essentially is done so that they experience this emotion of happiness. But what if I told you that there is something which is more powerful and which is more foundational to human consciousness than happiness and that something is serenity, that something is peace. Because let's understand, peace is a sort of a higher vibration emotion, even more superior than happiness. Because let's understand happiness. Happiness is a feeling of joy, a feeling of accomplishment. When something happens the way you wanted it to happen, you suddenly feel a sense of joy, a sense of goodness within you. And that is the reason why we are sort of endeavoring for so many things. But peace is something way beyond that. True peace is completely independent of what's happening around you. True peace is that quality which is sort of there in each one of us, which is inherently available in each one of us, which is our true nature. It is said in various schools of thought that peace is not something we acquire. Peace is something which we have sort of forgotten, which was supposed to be our natural instinct. Peace of mind is something which is natural to us. But we human beings have conditioned ourselves in such obnoxious ways that we have forgotten that peace is our true essence. Now you might be thinking, how can we say that peace is a true essence of a human being? Now anything which you naturally resonate with. I can't think of any person in this planet who would despise having a peaceful mind. Everyone wants peace, right? Everyone wants a peaceful frame of mind. Now you can only want something unless you are deeply connected to it at a subtle or at a gross level. In the sense that peace of mind is something which we all crave for. But the only thing is we don't realize that we are craving for peace of mind, we are craving for that calm until that is completely being deprived out of us or some situation creates so much of uh, turbulence in our mental canopy that we are craving more of it. Now essentially, if you look at the root cause dynamics, if you look at the root cause effect of every human endeavor, 
it is basically to acquire things why do we acquire things right have you ever asked yourself this question why do i acquire things why do i go into relationships why do i sort of want to experience certain experiences you will realize that you are doing all this so that you feel a sense of joy you feel a sense of happiness and there is nothing wrong in that and there is no way i'm suggesting that we all need to stop chasing our goals and just say that i am going to always be happy no matter what no that's not what i'm trying to drive your attention towards essentially what i'm trying to suggest to you is every human endeavor is essentially not for some achievement not for fame not for approval validation but all these things approval the validation the respect the love essentially they are evolving into this feeling of happiness now i talked about i talked a lot about happiness but essentially the focus of this video is about serenity tranquility peace of mind which is beyond happiness and unhappiness and the beautiful and the mesmerizing aspect of this particular quality is it's not dependent on the outside situations it's absolutely independent of what your 3d reality is defining at this point of time in your life your 3d reality might be completely devastated but this peace of mind which james is referring to is something which is independent of it and what are the means by which one can achieve this quality in his consciousness he says at the very beginning that calmness is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom it is a result of long and patient effort in self control now when we hear these words like self control like these words seem heavy to us because these come with a sense of uh, deprivation most of us equate self control with the sense of deprivation oh we, it seems that we need not we shouldn't enjoy life no that's not what this particular point of self control self control is basically suggesting us to have a monitor to have this rigorous sense of monitoring over our senses in the sense if you look at why people get dismantled or people get devastated they are absolutely addicted to the senses in the sense that a certain stimulus which gives you a sense of joy and tomorrow that particular stimulus is not available to you your entire life collapses now the reason why this collapse happened is you completely condition or you completely created a situation where all your happiness was dependent on that particular sense now suppose you are someone who has the habit of drinking coffee or tea every day and one fine day due to a certain circumstance you are not able to have that you are not able to have the daily dose of coffee or tea suddenly you feel your world has collapsed now this is a very small example to give you some context but this can also be applied to the larger aspects of our life and you will suddenly realize that how futile our conditioning has been and the reason why james talks about self control and not only about this book all our ancient seers all the people who have talked about spirituality and the source of everlasting happiness they always emphasized on the meaning on the purpose of self control because we can only get devastated if we are addicted to our senses to the inputs which our senses are giving us because the senses the things on the outside they are not completely under our control but what is under our control if we let that to become a slave of our senses of the output from the outside that is a catastrophic way to live to function so essentially the reason why the ancient seers or rishis and all schools of spiritual thought process emphasize the power of self control is so that we can stop deriving value out of sense deriving happiness from sense pleasures and turn inward because the true jewel is inward rumi put it so beautifully when he said stop searching the world for treasures because the true treasure is within yourself now he says that the rightness of this quality called serenity and tranquility is a result of long and persistent self control and also a deep and a holistic understanding of the laws of universe 
and which is not just an ordinary understanding of the laws of universe but a extremely deep oriented uh, a knowledge which is beyond normal a knowledge which is so wide and so deep at the same time only a person who has such a level of not only an intellectual understanding of the laws of universe but a aspect of realization now we can all read books we can all read go through spiritual videos and podcasts but what makes enlightened masters different from the ordinary folks is this aspect of realization we can always gather spiritual literature we can always sort of serve the hunger of spiritual knowledge but realization is a different ball game altogether realization is basically the ripeness is basically the complete amalgamation the complete processing of this particular understanding of the spiritual laws of the universe enlightenment is basically realization of the knowledge enlightenment is not about becoming something which you are not essentially enlightenment is about remembering what your true essence is which you have sort of forgotten because of all the conditioning and all the chaos which we have sort of come into in this world right now he says a man becomes calm in the measure that he understands himself as a thought evolved being for such knowledge necessitates the understanding of others as a result of thought and as it develops a right understanding and sees more and more clearly the internal relations of things by the action of cause and effect he ceases to fuse he ceases to fuss and fume and worry and grieve and remain poised steadfast serene now this is a beautiful concept and it talks about several different parallel narratives now he says a man who has deeply understood himself at a cellular level of consciousness he can also understand other people he has a deep understanding of the internal relations of cause and effect and as a result of that he ceases to fume he ceases to fuss and he ceases to worry and grieve and he remains poised steadfast and serene now if you think about it from a general viewpoint most of us we lose our equanimity because we don't understand and we are because we are not at peace with the present moment because we always have reasons to worry we always have reasons to fume we always have reasons to grieve but a person who has developed this deep understanding at a subconscious level he will stop fuming and he will stop worrying and grieving reason being he can clearly see he can clearly understand the cause and effect dynamics now this is the reason why enlightened people are so at peace with themselves you will never find a truly enlightened master to worry to grieve to fume to fuss right because they have realized it not just from an intellectual standpoint but a understanding standpoint and a realization standpoint the calm man having learned how to govern himself knows how to adapt himself to others and they in turn revere his spiritual strength now this quality of compassion which is so much talked about in today's modern day self help literature now compassion is not just lip service compassion is essentially to understand this universal concept of god consciousness to understand that we might all look different at a gross level but at a certain level we all are made of the divine consciousness now one thing is to talk about it one thing is to realize it from a standpoint of your own awareness and consciousness and once you have that deep understanding built you are incapable of hating someone you are incapable of being critical to someone and compassion is a natural offspring of that understanding <clears throat> the more tranquil a man becomes the greater is his success his influence his power for good <clears throat> even the ordinary trader will find his business prosperity increase as he develops a greater self control and equanimity now james is saying the more tranquil a man becomes the greater is his success his influence now just think about it <clears throat> we would normally associate with a person who 
who is generally of an equanimal, who has a serene demeanor, who has a sense of equanimity established, and people who have been established leaders, people who have done, who people find comfortable to be with, they always have this calm. This they don't have a agitated consciousness. They are always calm, grounded. They have a serene smile on the face. And this is these are the people who eventually become leaders because with the serene mind, you can see things clearly. Now I have given an, this example in one of my earlier videos, but I think it's a powerful example to sort of reiterate the power of having the calm state of mind. Now suppose you have two water bodies, one water body is completely crystal clear and another water body is a polluted, a huge polluted gutter wherein a lot of things are flowing around in an absolute chaos. Now suppose a person is standing between these two water bodies and he throws a pebble first in the pristine uh, water body, right? A water body is absolutely clear, completely free of any chaos. Once he puts that pebble, it's, we can see the immediate ramifications are the ripples in the water body. But if I put the same pebble in that water body which is filled with chaos and which is completely a mess, I probably will not see any kind of an effect. Even if I put a huge boulder into that chaotic water body, there would not be any kind of an effect. Same is with a person who has a calm demeanor. Because he can see things very clearly, his actions are very precise and his intentions are manifested effortlessly. Now, this is the reason why enlightened people had the potential to create miracles. Now, there's this beautiful book called Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahans Yogananda, which is a worldwide sensation. It was read by the likes of Steve Jobs, Virat Kohli, and in that book, there were certain aspects which modern science cannot comprehend or probably cannot even explain. Because it talked about this miracles and the kind of uh, things which were accomplished by yogis, enlightened masters, which cannot be explained by the logic. Now these miracles were sort of happening, they were able to do those miracles because of this state of mind. They had a completely enlightened state of mind and miracles was just like a normal day-to-day -day affair for these enlightened masters. Now this is not a video on miracles, but I just want to emphasize this power of serenity. Even if you take in the material world, Mahendra Singh Dhoni who is considered to be one of the most powerful leaders Indian cricket has ever seen in terms of his captaincy. He is known to be a person of absolute poise, absolute serenity. The strong calm mind is always loved and revered. He is like a shade giving tree in a thirsty land or a sheltering rock in a storm. Who does not love a tranquil heart, a sweet tempered balanced life? It does not matter whether it rains or shines or what changes come to those possessing these blessings, for they are always sweet, serene and calm. The exquisite poise of character which we call serenity is the last lesson of culture. It's the flowering of life, the fruitage of the soul. It is precious as wisdom, more to be desired than gold, yeah, than even fine gold. How insignificant mere money-seeking looks in comparison with a serene life, a life that dwells in the ocean of truth, beneath the waves, beyond the reach of tempest and eternal calm. Now, he says that people who are genuinely tranquil, genuinely serene, they are automatically loved and revered by people. Now, there is a certain uh, fragrance. Now, science has also proven that if you are associating with a person who is completely pious in character and who has a certain bandwidth of spiritual potency, you will automatically feel, you will automatically feel the poise of that person. Now, you might already have experienced this. So, when, whenever we move to, go to temples, right, the reason why we feel so peaceful, even whether you are an atheist or someone who has faith in God, you will automatically feel peaceful. The reason is, it is said that thoughts, they travel far. It's not only confined to the person who is thinking it. And we are all creating this aura around us. 
which sort of is the cumulative sum of all our thoughts, beliefs and emotions. And the people who are generally positive and people who are generally serene, people would like to be with them because they feel a sense of calm, they feel a sense of serenity around them. And everyone, every human being, deepest craving is peace, is serenity, though they might not realize it at the outset. That is what each every being, every human being is craving for. Now he says it's more precious than gold, right? And if you think about it, right, if you are given a certain thing which is absolutely independent of what happens on the outside and it is so powerful that it has a potential to sort of gravitate all those things from the outside automatically. This can, this probably is the real treasure, right? This, there is nothing more which is better than this quality. And this is what all enlightened yogis and this is probably the culmination. This is probably the end result of all spiritual practices, which all are sort of engaging in. The end result is this. He says that serenity is the last lesson of culture. It's the flowering of life, the fruitage of the soul. It is precious as wisdom, more to be desired than gold. How insignificant mere money seeking looks in comparison with the serene life. Contentment is an art. How many people we know who soar their lives, who ruin all that is sweet and beautiful by explosive tempers, who destroy their poise of character and make blood blood. It is a question whether the great majority of people do not ruin their lives and mar their happiness by lack of self-control. How few people we meet in life who are well balanced, who have the exquisite poise, characteristics of the finished character. Yes, humanity surges with uncontrolled passion, is tumultuous with ungoverned grief, is blown about by anxiety and doubt. Only the wise man, only he whose thoughts are controlled and purified makes the wind and storms of the soul obey. He's saying that humanity is filled with countless examples of how people have ruined their life because of their immature thought process. If things don't happen the way I want them to happen, they are frustrated. They vilify the circumstances are the people associated with them. James is saying that how foolish these people are because they don't understand the rudimentary principles of life. And they are sort of chasing these things from the outside, but essentially they fail to understand the chasing from the outside is always going to be hollow. No matter how much you experience happiness from outside sources, there's always going to be a fluctuating dimension to that. And he says that people who become so frustrated, furiated, and they ruin their lives and sort of they showcase this vibration to the universe that I sort of don't respect the things which came on my lap, right? There are countless people in this planet who do not respect the things which were given to them. They're sort of ungrateful to that. And they also sort of find shortcomings on the things which divinity had given them. And eventually those things which God had given them is taken away from them. And when it's taken away from them, at that point of time, they realize what they lost. There's a beautiful quote which says that one day we might lose diamonds in our quest for fetching stones. This is how sadly most of us function. We are sort of trying to gather stones, but we forget to acknowledge and understand that in the process of sort of accumulating stones, we lost a rare and a real diamond. How few people we meet in life who are well balanced, who have that exquisite poise which is characteristic to the finished character. Yes, humanity surges with uncontrolled passion, anger, is tumultuous with ungoverned grief, is blown about by anxiety and doubt. Only the wise man, only he whose thoughts are controlled and purified, makes the winds and storms of the soul obey. This is a very powerful sentence to sort of end this paragraph. He says the winds and storms of the soul obey a person who is deeply serene, who is not affected by what's happening on the outside. Now, one thing you need to understand, right? He's not saying to become non-assertive. He's not saying that we need to just be a silent witness to the circumstances. Essentially, what he's trying to drive is, we should not let our internal state of mind be a slave 
to the outside circumstances. The whole premise of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna talked about this in excruciating detail. Now, Bhagavad Gita is an epitome of spiritual literature, wherein Lord Krishna talks about this aspect and he gives the sign of a true yogi. A person who becomes a true accomplished yogi, he is always having this jewel of calmness. He is always serene because he is not affected, he doesn't have this fluctuating thought process. He suddenly doesn't just bust in happiness and suddenly st st he is not someone who completely deprives himself of, you know, he becomes blown out of happiness, something happens as per his accord and he is not someone who laments and grieves if something has been grabbed away from him. He is a person of true divinity. Tempest tossed souls, wherever he may be, under whatsoever conditions he may live, know this, in the ocean of life, the icels of blessedness are smiling and the shiny shore of your ideal awaits your coming. Keep your hand <coughs> firmly upon the helm of thought. In the bark of your soul reclines the commanding master. He does but sleep, wake him. Self-control is strength. Right thought is mastery. Calmness is power. Say unto your heart, peace, be still. He says self-control is strength. Right thought is mastery. Calmness is power. Now the beautiful aspect is that the more you increase your self-control practices, the more strength you build. And with the right thought, when you master this particular practice of self-control, strength is building. And once strength is built, as a natural offspring, calmness comes to you naturally. And that is true power. Now, this is a beautiful way to put it. If you even want to understand it from a gross level, you go to the gym, you do exercise, you build your strength, and from that building of strength comes true power. And you, once you master the right kind of exercise, once you master the art of exercising effectively, power is generated within and just equate this, all your exercises, right? It can be the right way of exercising, the right thought process, it can be equated to the right thought, the right technique of exercising, that can be equated to right thought. And your practice of self-control, that can be your exercises, right? Uh, whatever you are doing in your gym, you are doing your cardio, you are doing your strength work, you are lifting up dumbbells, that can be equated to self-control. You can constantly start increasing your capacity to control yourself, to sort of de-addict yourself from the senses. And as a result of that, calmness is, as natural outspring, serves, becomes a part of your consciousness, becomes part of your default consciousness and that's the source of true power. That's the real treasure which humanity, consciously or unconsciously, is chasing. Thank you so much for your time on my video. I know it's become a huge video. I mean, it's become a longer video, but there cannot be a better culmination. There cannot be a better ending of the series as a man thinketh by James Allen, where we talked about the ultimate treasure which mankind can acquire and can feel and relish the significance and the magnificence of it. Thank you so much for your time on your video and if you really enjoyed this video, don't forget to like the video, don't forget to share it with a couple of your friends. Also, do subscribe to my channel and I would love your candid feedback on my today's video. Thank you so much and meet you in the next video. Bye.